Hello and welcome to Indiana Arts Desk. I'm Marcus Jackman. Coming up tonight, a singer's part in a continuing exhibit at Minatrista in Muncie and the arts calendar. But first, recently Taylor University in Upland hosted its fourth Francis White Eubank Colloquium on C.S. Lewis and Friends. Friends such as J.R.R. Tolkien, T.S. Eliot, G.K. Chesterton, as well as some other writers who used their first names like Dorothy Sayers. It was a long conference and uh, somebody said why don't we invite Dorothy Sayers to lecture she'd be a draw and we all sat back in astonishment and the professor was very gloomy about it and said oh well I suppose she can't do any harm well she came and she lectured and I was amazed by the quality of her lecture and decided I'd like to get to know her That's Barbara Reynolds, one of the participants in the colloquium, who became a friend and eventual collaborator with Dorothy Sayers. Reynolds says people likely know of Sayers for one of two reasons. The first, her detective novels. Which made her famous, first of all, in the creation of Lord Peter Whimsey, the aristocratic sleuth. But she's very famous. She belongs to what is called the golden age of detective novelists. And uh, Lord Peter Whimsey is as famous in most people's lives as Sherlock Holmes, you see. He goes on living in people's imaginations. Sayers is also known, and it is this reason for which this reporter knows of Sayers, for her translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. However, when she died suddenly of a heart attack in 1957, the last volume, Paradiso, was left unfinished. So Reynolds took up the reins while still in mourning for her friend. The thing that I admired about her was when I was trying to wrestle with the the law of the ascent in in Divina Commedia, uh, when I, I finally started to figure it out, there it was in her editor and her translator's notes on the very next page as I was... Do you mean in Paradiso uh, or Inferno? That was, uh, I think it was in Paradiso where I saw the Law of the Ascent finally explicated for me. I'm really? Sure. Yes, well, I, I, I did that. I was reading back and forth between Ciardi's and, and Sayer's translations in mm-hmm. undergrad. Yes. So. Well, uh, well, now let me tell you how it came about. She died before she finished her translation of Paradiso. She'd got to Canto 20 and there were 13 cantos remaining and I was asked to do those, take that on, and I wrote the introduction on all the notes. So you're thanking me if I able, was able to help you. Well, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I'm glad I, I made it clear. It was a very terrifying job to take on immediately after her death, you can imagine. But while the Lord Peter Whimsey novels and Divine Comedy would more than comprise a deserved literary heritage, Sayers' other work of note, The Man Born to be King, created a storm of controversy. The radio plays commissioned by the BBC were dramatizations of the life of Christ, At the time, 1943, there was a law against presenting any member of the Trinity on stage in England. And there was a tremendous fuss when people heard that that the person of Christ was going to be speaking dialogue which wasn't in the Bible and so on. Tremendous opposition. Questions were asked in the House of Commons. Could it be stopped and so on? But once they got started, they were a tremendous success and had a great influence on, on listeners and changed people's lives. They were really very remarkable productions. Unfortunately, I wasn't with him very long before he died. And um, he he said one time to me, he said, you know, I know what the divine joke on you would be. I might utter my last immortal words and you won't be here to hear them. But I think in one way the um, divine joke in one way might be on him because... Though he died, I keep on acting as a secretary, you know. That's Walter Hooper, personal secretary in perpetuity to C.S. or Clive Staples Lewis, known to his friends as Jack. If Dorothy Sayers is known for the two main hats that she wore, detective novelist and translator, C.S. Lewis wore three, literary scholar, science fiction and children's novelist, and Christian broadcaster and essayist. C.S. Lewis died in 1963, but over the years, Hooper has continued to publish his papers and letters. Tolkien um, one time was teasing me. I had just given Professor Tolkien one of the, oh, um, something like a fourth or fifth volume of Lewis's essays I brought up. And he said, you know, C.S. Lewis is the only friend I've ever had who's published more since he died than before he died. And I said, I know exactly what you mean, but I said, the same could happen to you. Hooper says letters are an excellent way to find out more about writers from the past, to learn the context of their thoughts and more. However, he fears that email may be doing away with letter writing as a discipline. A young man in Oxford who's writing to his mother, to his father, his sister, his other brother, and friends. And I said, you know what you should be doing for your parents' 
silver wedding anniversary, collecting all of your emails from the family, keeping the dates and all of that, and edit them into a file, write in, um, do an index and do a volume of them, and keep the family letters. Mm -hmm. And while C.S. Lewis's formidable intellect might give the impression that he was a stereotypical Oxford don, jacketed in tweed, dining on roast venison, Hooper says after his conversion, C.S. Lewis discovered the virtues of all kinds of people. He was very untypical of Oxford don. You know? Of course, he, he was a learned man, but that didn't, didn't mean he didn't like simple things, too. I mean, in his own home, he was a very simple man who liked... Um, Really, sausages and mashed potatoes with a glass of beer. Taylor University holds its colloquium on C.S. Lewis and Friends biannually. Taylor is also home to an extensive C.S. Lewis collection of books and some furniture from the Eagle and Child pub where Lewis, Tolkien, Chesterton, and the other Inklings were wont to meet.